And we saw last week how Jesus embodies that. So uh, God as Son, uh, looking at, as we've been sort of breaking down what the Trinity is, Father, Son, and Spirit. Last week we looked at Jesus as the embodiment of that selfless love, and it's expressed through servanthood. So we looked at all the different sort of um, aspects of who Jesus is. Jesus as Messiah, as Son of Man, as Son of God, all the various titles that often get used for Jesus. And we saw them all through the lens of servanthood, that Jesus um, fulfills those roles as a servant, again, not as a dominator or as a, as, um, a bully or as you know, the kind of perhaps power that we normally associate with, with um, leadership or um, entitlement. So uh, Jesus re- kind of redefines God for us in the flesh. This week, we're going to look at the, what's known as the third person of the Trinity, of this, um, this view of God. Um, the Holy Spirit. And it also coincides with um, today is the day of Pentecost, right? Or, or the, the festival of Pentecost. In the, in the, it's a day in the church calendar where we especially celebrate a story that happens, and we can read about, and we'll look at in a second, um, in the second chapter of Acts, where uh, the, uh, the Holy Spirit is poured out on humanity. Now, that festival, um, this festival of uh, Pentecost, is, is, it's called Pentecost because that's the Greek word for a um, Hebrew festival called, called Shavuot. Now, Shavuot happens uh, about 50 days or 49, seven weeks after Passover. Um, and uh, so the, 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 you know, the Greek word for, for uh, 50 involves the, the prefix penti, um, so that's why it's called Pentecost. So once, you know, the uh, the Hebrews became Hellenized, and a lot of them started speaking Greek. They used that term Pentecost. Um, and so this, what happened, the story we're going to read, it happened on that festival. Now, the, what's really interesting, I think, is that the, the festival of Shavuot is not going to happen for another three weeks or so, because this year Passover happened quite a, uh, quite a while after Easter. And what we've done as Christians is, you know, to some degree, hijack that festival and we've made it 50 years after Easter rather than after Pentecost, and we uh, 50 years up, 50 days after Easter rather than Passover, and we still call it Pentecost. So, you know, is it, can, that can sometimes be a little bit confusing, but, you know, what Pentecost has come to represent for us now in the Christian tradition is the Holy Spirit. So it's kind of fitting that we're talking about it on this particular day. So let's, let's um, take a quick look at that story. I'm not going to go into too much detail or explanation about this story. There's a bunch of different questions about it in uh, the material this week. So you can explore that story a little bit yourselves. Um, We're only going to read the first part of it. Um, You're encouraged in the discussion questions to read a lot more of that story. Um, But we're going to get a flavor for it here. So when the day of Pentecost came, okay, this Jewish festival, they were all together in one place. They, in this story is uh, the disciples, the, the, the followers of Jesus. So Jesus has, has um, ascended into heaven. Jesus is no longer with them. They're on their own, um, and they're all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Meaning, inferring they're probably uneducated people. Uh, They're from a a, 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 a traditionally uneducated part of the, the land they were living in then how is it that each of us hears them in our our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. So there's a lot of languages being spoken. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much wine. It's a good explanation for anything that sometimes, you know, you, oh, you just had too much wine. Um, now that story goes on, and what happens is Peter gets up, you know, one of Jesus' preeminent followers gets up and explains what's happening here, that the, the Holy Spirit is being poured out on all humanity, and he quotes some Hebrew prophecies and explains, you know, why we should have known this was going to happen 
and, and all that kind of stuff. It's, a, it's an amazing story. It's kind of a weird story in a way, right? That sounds, it's a little bit strange. Um, you know, there's some strange phenomena going on there. It's all a little unusual. As I said in the discussion questions, there's opportunity to discuss it and kind of unpick it a little bit. All I'm going to say about it at this point is that what we have, and, and, and you know, there's a chapter in the book of Acts before this one, which describes the, these early followers of Jesus as being very afraid, hidden away, uncertain about what, what they're supposed to be doing and, and, and even the implications of all that they've learned from Jesus. So what we have is sort of a, a ragtag group of people who don't really know what they're doing. And then after this thing happens, after the Holy Spirit is poured out, um, they really do know what they're doing and they, they engage in all kinds of activity and begin living the kind of life that Jesus talked about and begin living the kind of life that we've been talking about throughout this series, this life that is full of love, this life that's real life, that's kind of the, is connected to the, the, the life force of the universe itself, the life force of God, the, 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 the deep oneness with God that is, is, is being experienced. So something has happened here. Something, you know, we, we can make all kinds of uh, observations about the story, but the one I want to make is something has changed as a result of their engagement with the Holy Spirit, this, this mysterious third person of the Trinity, something dramatic has happened. There's a, there's a transformation that's taken place. Now, um, you know, I think it's fair to say that they probably had a great deal of understanding about the things that Jesus talked about. Okay, they, they, they kind of, to some degree, got it, but they weren't living it out. So something about the Spirit means it empowers us to, it seems through this story, to engage in the, the truths that Jesus is talking about or has been talking about, to engage with the life that Jesus was talking about. And, and Jesus um, intimated this. Jesus suggested that this would be the case. Let's, let's just sort of backtrack a little bit to when Jesus was around. And Jesus in John 14 uh, begins talking in this Trinitarian language that we've looked at before. He talks about, he says things like, I and the Father are one, and I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. And then he talks about oneness with us. He'll say, I am in you, and you are in me. And, you know, we've looked at some of that language before where we talked about the oneness of God our, and our oneness with God. Well, here's Jesus uh, again. He says, if you love me, and we've been talking a lot about love in this series. So Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Okay, so there's a lot of this oneness language going on. I'm in the Father, you are in me, I'm in you. Jesus also seems to be saying that, okay, um, uh, some, a helper is going to be sent to you. We uh, would conclude that that's the Holy Spirit, and he's more explicit about that in some of the things that he says later on. He's, he's also implying that in some way he is that Spirit. Right, because he's saying, "I'm not going to, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to come to you." But he's also saying that 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 coming to you is going to be slightly different. It's he talks about the spirit. So what we get here is the is the origin of the spirit and Jesus as part of the Trinity. You know, we we've, we've, we've talked about that in weeks gone by. That that the spirit is God and Jesus is God and the Father is God. So we have some some Trinitarian thinking here, and I'm, I'm not going to get into that too much today. Um, but we also have here this sense of the Spirit being within us, that, that, that there's going to be this gift that the, the, the being of Christ, the life of Christ, is going to dwell in us and within humanity through the Spirit, through God's Spirit, through the Holy Spirit. And that, that's, that's the same Spirit as the Spirit of Christ. What we're also hearing, so, so that you can see how that relates to what happens on the day of Pentecost, right? Now, I don't just... Just as an aside here, I'd, when we read stories like the story on the day of Pentecost, we've, that story is being told to us in a certain way. Okay? We've been told a story. We're not actually watching what happened. We're somewhat removed, it, removed from it, and we're being, we're being told about it. And like all stories, they get told to accentuate certain points. So 
it, it, one of, based on what happened on the day of Pentecost in that story we read, we could imagine that, you know, that God is up in heaven somewhere with his finger on a button, which, and as soon as God presses that button, then suddenly the Holy Spirit's released on all of humanity. And, and, I, and to me, that, I, I find it hard to relate to a God that behaves like that. That doesn't seem, you know, I, I don't think God is like, okay, now is the era of the Holy Spirit, and before that era there was no Holy Spirit, and now there is. I, I, the Spirit was clearly around, has always been around, right? And we can read about the Holy Spirit in the Hebrew Scriptures. We hear Jesus was full of the Spirit. It says that in Luke time and time again. Um, so the Spirit is around. What The difference here is that these followers of Jesus just hadn't connected to that reality. And what we're reading about in Pentecost is them connecting to that reality in a very dramatic kind of way. And probably, as I'm going to make this point a little bit later on, the, our connection to that reality happens in normally in way less dramatic ways than that. It happens day in, day out by lots of small things. But occasionally it can happen in this sort of watershed, almost like a conversion experience, of, which is a lot more dramatic. Some of us may have had some of those kind of more dramatic experiences, and they're fantastic, but actually the way we experience God and the way, the way we experience the Spirit of God happens more on a consistent basis, quite quietly and normally. And we're going to see that as we, as we, as we go through this today. Okay, but Jesus kind of gives a big hint about what is going to happen when the Spirit is given to us. There's this gift of a helper who's going to empower us to live this way that Jesus is talking about. And I think the implication there is that not a, you know, G- Jesus really says, if you, if you love me, you'll obey me. In other words, I, I don't think Jesus is saying, look, um, if you love me, you're going to just do what I say for Pete's sake. And it's sort of a forceful thing. It's, it's rather Jesus saying, look, ex- love is going to be expressed through obedience. This way of life I'm talking about, that I, I, it's going to be good for you, that you actually want, want to, to, to live, it's, it's based on love. Um, that, that obedience is really hard, though. It's hard to live that way. So I'm going to give you a helper. So I'm going to be with you. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to empower you from the inside out to live this kind of way. And that, what that empowerment is, is the Holy Spirit. Okay, so Jesus is sort of breaking it down, although he's still obviously using somewhat cryptic and, and, and somewhat mysterious language. Now, let me give you a personal example of some of what I'm talking about here. Um, let's go back to Lent. And um, did anybody set any goals for Lent, by the way? You're not going to have to say what they were or how well you did. Did anybody uh, sort of have, I'm going to give up this or I want to do that? Well, I set a goal for Lent. And, 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 and the goal I set, and this, may, this probably sounds really lame, but the goal I set myself was of what I wanted to practice less of was bad language. Um, and that sounds like, well, that's not a very, very high goal, but let me explain what, what I mean. Like, I sometimes use really bad language, right? And um, I don't do it in public because people would think bad things about me if I did that. So I, I do it in private, um, when, usually when I'm on, on my own. And I'm, I'm sorry, you know, this is sort of a confession, but um, if I'm on my own and I get frustrated about something or and someone else, you know, in the car is a great example of that, um, uh, b- but frequently on my own, I, I, you know, if I get mad about something, terrible words come out of my mouth, okay? I'm just, I'm just putting that out there. Um, I know that's shocking to you and, and you don't struggle with anything like that, but when I'm on my own, I can be pretty offensive, right? And it's, sometimes it shocks me, and, I, and, 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 you know, bad language is bad language. I mean, I'm not sure it the, the, makes it even into the top, sense of, top ten of worst things in the world, right? But for me, I realize it reflects something not good in me. It reflects frustration, you know, kind of frustration at myself, um, impatience, a lack of gentleness, a lack of uh, self-control. Uh, it, it reflects deeper issues that aren't good, right? Um, some of you may struggle with these things as well, or I may be the only person in the room. Anyway, so um, I, I had the goal for Lent. I, I, I wanted to uh, do less of that, <laughs> right, let's just say. And actually, I didn't do that bad. I did pretty, pretty reasonably well, not perfect, until the last Sunday of Lent, right? And that's Palm Sunday, last Sunday. And um, it just so happened that I, had, um, I was getting ready to come out to church, because I'm the pastor. And I 
happen to be borrowing somebody else's car. A long story about that. Um, actually, it was Steve Mather's car. Is Steve here? So it's really Steve's fault, actually, why all this happened. <laughs> So he lends me his car, and it's a stick shift. And I'm, I used to drive stick shifts all the time. Oh, yeah, piece of cake. I'll be fine with the stick shift. So I get out, and I'm coming, coming in. And I'm on a bit of an agenda on a Sunday, right? It's, it's my job. It's my work. I need to be there at a certain time. And I get in the car, start the engine, and I cannot find reverse. You know how I've got to back out to get out the driveway? And you, I'm lifting it up and going down and pushing it down and going forward. I'm doing everything. And after about 10 minutes, I'm, <laughs> I'm so frustrated the worst words are coming out of my mouth. I'm just, you... It's like, have you seen uh, Faulty Towers when he gets out of his car and beats the car with a branch? Have you seen that? And swears at his car. And so I blew all of Lent on that one day. I, I'd sort of done pretty good, not perfect, but on that day, just, just blew out. And, and I'm sorry, I want to apologize to you now because you all feel that I prepare in prayer and meditation and some form of purity... Whereas, actually, I was just frustrated that I was going to be late to a meeting, right, because we have a meeting before, b- before the service, and everybody's going to think badly of me, and I'm going to look like a bad leader, and a b- bad this, bad that, and I'm frustrated myself, and angry, you know, all the rest of it, okay? So it's all this stuff, this underlying stuff, this frustration and fears and anxieties spills out of me. Now, let's go back 20-odd years to another car situation, that Steve Mather had nothing to do with. So if you take Steve Mather out of the equation here, everything, everything goes way better. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so this is mid, uh, early to mid-90s, so t- over 20 years ago. I went to this conference. I've, I think I've shared some of this story before. I went to this conference where, to cut a long story short, I had this encounter with the love of God. It's like I, th- through various means, I, I had this experience of an overwhelming experience of God loving me. It was, it was probably, you know, more like Pentecost. The, the, the only real experience in my life that has been more like that sort of exaggerated, dramatic experience of Pentecost, one of the only ones or few that I've experienced where I would say it, uh, there were, I could physically feel it. It had a huge emotional impact on me. There was a major reaction in, in my whole being to the presence of God and an, an engagement with God's love. And I came out of that, that night, I walked out of that building, and I was, kind of, I, I was almost like walking on air. I just felt so full of God's love. I was so connected to God and so connected to oneness, and the, I felt one with God, one with, one with everybody. And I walked to my car, and I was going to drive home. I had to drive about an hour or so to get back home late at night, and somebody had broken into my car, and they'd smashed the window. Uh, it wasn't a very good car. I think they ch- got in my car and thought, oh, this isn't worth stealing, and changed their minds. But they, I, I, they, the, the group of people who had done it was, were stood on the other side of the parking lot because they started sort of taunting me, so I knew it was them. Uh, they may have, maybe it wasn't, and they were just you know, deciding to talk, taunt me, but I thought it was them. I felt nothing but love and forgiveness for those people, right? I just, it, I, I, didn't feel, I didn't even feel angry. I just thought, I thought, oh gosh, I wonder what made them do that. Poor guys. And, uh, and I, I, I said, oh, never mind. I brushed the glass off the seats and I, I drove home. It didn't even faze me one bit. Now, what can we conclude from those two stories other than I have probably regressed spiritually in the last 20 years? <laughs> I do, I do, really, I'm, this is sort of, reverse discipleship, right? Um, maybe it's an illustration of that. But I, I think in one of those settings, I am more in touch with, this, with the love of God. I'm more in touch with this beautiful, amazing reality that we've been talking about the last few weeks than in the other scenario, right? And, and it doesn't take a genius to work out which one is which. When I was connected to God's love, when I'm engaged, when I'm... It, full of God's spirit, if you like, um, I'm living a different kind of life. I see life differently. I think differently. I see myself differently. I see other people differently. And in that moment, I respond differently. When I, I'm less full of God's spirit, and I'm letting fear and anxiety and frustration and impatience and anger at myself and the universe take over, and I'm afraid... I'm experiencing less of God's Spirit, and I'm experiencing less of that beautiful reality we've been talking about, and in the moment, I respond very differently. This is, I think, the essence of what 
the Holy Spirit is all about, what, what Jesus means by giving us the Spirit to empower us to live. Because Jesus is talking about amazing things. God is love. We are one with God. We are in God. God is in us. God is everywhere. We're, God loves everybody. God is in everybody. Jesus is talking about amazing things. But, there, but how do we connect to that? How do we, how do we relate to that? How, how do we experience it? How do we engage with it? How do we live it out? Well, we live it out through the Spirit. That's, that's how this thing happens. Now, the early church wrestled with this a lot because they were talk, that, like Jesus has gone and they've got to work out, how do we live this life? I mean, Jesus isn't here anymore. I mean, what did, when he said this, that, and the other, what did it mean? And how, how do we engage? So the early church wrestled with this a lot. And they, uh, they sort of wrestled, I think, um, primarily um, through experience and, and, and engagement. And we read a lot about that in, in the book of Acts, but we also read a lot about it in uh, some of the writings of the New Testament, particularly the writings of Paul. And we're going to look at some of those in a second. But I, I, I guess as we think about this spirit business, I want to break it down practically into three simple questions. And we kind of sort of, um, you know, look at it and then try and apply it to ourselves. The first question would be this, like, what does the Spirit do? What, what is the Spirit doing? What, and then the second question would be, what does that look like? In particular, what does it look like in our human experience, in our lives, in our reality? What does it look like? And then thirdly, how do we experience it? How do we engage with it? Well, I mean, what, what's the mechanism by which we can have more of that? Okay, and as I mentioned, you know, we're going to look at some of the um, writings of Paul to, to sort of engage with this because Paul wrestled. He, he was one of the early church leaders. He was, he was the, the most um, prolific writers of the early church leaders. He, he wasn't the only uh, leader in the church in those early days by any means, but he, he, he was certainly the one who, certainly today we have more writings of his than anybody else. Um, so we kind of got some, some evidence of what he was thinking and what he was wrestling with. And a couple of things that he wrote and thought about a lot were, were these things. He talked about being in Christ, okay, and, and, and this, this sort of being in this mysterious way, being in this beautiful way, this, 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 the way of Christ, the way of life, the way of love. He talked about what does it mean to be in Christ? Okay, when Jesus said, I am in you and you are in me, what does that mean? He wrestled with that thing, okay? He also wrestled with, what does it mean to live, for want of a better term, this is my language, the good life? In other words, he talks about things, um, he uses a word sin a lot. Okay, and we, we, we sort of associate sin with, you know, it's a very religious word, it's to do with judgment and bad things that we do, you know, and which, which it is. But he's talking about it more in light of, there's, there's, there's ways to live badly, selfishly, meanly, and stuff that is not good for us or good for anybody else, and there's ways to live well. How do we live well? How do we live the good life? How do we live this rich life that Jesus talked about? And those two things, being in Christ and living this life, are closely connected for, closely connected for Paul. And, and to illustrate that, I want us to look at a passage in one of his most famous writings, the book of Romans, and we're going to look at chapters uh, or parts of chapters 7 and 8. And I'm actually going to read it from a, a different version. Let me see if I've got this one here. Yeah. Um, it's going to appear on the screen. I'm just going to read it up here because it's, it's fairly lengthy. Okay, so we're going to read a sort of a section of Scripture here that is a little bit longer than we might normally read. Um, and I'm reading it from a, a, a version of the Bible called The Message. And many of us will be familiar with that. It's a very uh, modern translation. Sometimes it's so modern that it feels a little bit corny. But very often, some of the trickiest passages in the Bible to understand are translated in this, in this version so well that they almost just explain themselves. And that's why I want to read from this particular version. So what, we're reading from Romans 7 and 8, and we're kind of addressing the question, what does the Holy Spirit do? Um, so let's so bear that in mind as we read through. Here's Paul. I can anticipate the response that is coming. I know that all God's commands are spiritual, but I'm not. Isn't this also your experience? Yes, I'm full of myself. After, a, after all, I spend a long time in sin's prison. In other words, what he's saying is, I live this more negative life. I know how to live the negative life. Okay, I know how to do that. What I don't understand about myself is that I can decide one way, but then I act the other, doing things I absolutely despise. 
So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. So in other words, what he's saying is, we need this, these commands of God, and Jesus was talking about, you know, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments, right? We need these commands. We need this directive, this, this way of living, because without it, we tend to live another way, which is kind of negative, right? In other words, we know, we know something about what is good, but very often, even though we may desire that, we end up doing bad things, right? I think we can all identify that. But I need something more, for I know the law, but still can't keep it. And if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize that I don't have what it takes. Okay, so to live this life, to do these good things, we need some power to live that way. It's, not, it's, it's going to take more than effort or good intentions. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway, like me and that car. Right? My best intentions, I am not going to swear this lens. Didn't work out. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. So there's something not right. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decided to, to, to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Part of me covertly rebels. Sorry, parts of me covertly rebel. And just when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but I'm pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. With the arrival of Jesus the Messiah, that fateful dilemma is resolved. Those who enter into Christ's being here for us, so the presence of Christ in our lives, in other words, those who want to enter into that mysterious reality that we've been talking about of living this Trinitarian love, those who enter into Christ's being here for us no longer have to live under a continuous low-lying black cloud. A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, maybe a reference to Pentecost there, has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you from a fated lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. God went for the jugular when he sent his own son. He didn't deal with the problem as something remote and unimportant. In his son, Jesus, he personally took on the human condition entered into the disordered mess of struggling humanity in order to set it right once and for all. The law code, so commands, you know, best intentions, weakened as it always was by fractured human nature, could never have done that. The law always ended up being used as a band-aid on sin instead of a deep healing of it. And now what the law code asked for, but couldn't deliver, is accomplished as we, instead of redoubling our own efforts, so instead of just trying a bit harder, if we simply embrace the Spirit, what the Spirit is doing in us. Those who think they can do it on their own end up obsessed with measuring their own moral muscle, but ne never get around to exercising it in real life. Those who trust God's action in them find that God's Spirit is in them, living and breathing God, just like Jesus said. That was me, not Paul. Obsession with self in these matters is a dead end. Attention to God leads us out into the open, into a spacious, free life. Focusing on the self is the opposite of focusing on God. Anyone completely absorbed in self ignores God, ends up thinking more about self than God. That person ignores who God is and what he is doing. Okay, so there's what we have there, I think, is in, a, a respo in response to that question, what does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit sets us free. That's fundamentally, I think, what the Spirit of God does. The Spirit of God sets us free from this tyranny of what Paul calls the law of sin and death. In other words, this sort of, the, the natural way of the world, it seems. The, 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 all that the environment seems to, and, and culture around us seems to uh, um, lure us into. It, we're set free from that and we're empowered to live in this different 
beautiful, amazing way. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, setting us free to really live. Now, what does that look like? Okay, that's the, that's the next question. What does that look like? And I, I just want to just quickly run through four things that I think um, represent the manifestation of that freedom in our lives. And they're all interrelated, okay? You know, th- and this isn't an exhaustive list by any means, but they're all interrelated. First one I would say is this, healing, okay? So the, 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 the work of the Spirit in us is healing. Now, if you look at the stories about Jesus, there's healing happening left, right, and center, right? We can't avoid that. Um, if you look at what happened in the early church as a result of um, their engagement in the reality of Christ, there's healing happening left, right, and center. Now, that's um, very physical. And we, 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 when we read the stories about Jesus, there's lots of physical healing. But it's also very emotional, very psychological. It's a relation, there's relational healing going on. There's social healing going on. Jesus is not just healing individuals, but he's reaching out across um, uh, cultural lines. He's breaking down barriers between men and women, between Jews and Gentiles, between people who are viewed as clean and unclean. Jesus is breaking down and bringing healing to society as a whole. So there's a, 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 we need to think about that healing in a holistic way, but the work of the Spirit within us is healing and reconciling, okay? The work of the Spirit is transforming. So another, what, what, the, what does that look like is transformation. Now I'm going to I'm going to read another passage here of Paul's, where Paul talks about what what transformation looks like. In other words, if the Spirit is at work in us, the Spirit is is tr- and, and we're engaged in with the Spirit. The Spirit is changing us, making us more like the way of Jesus, more like Jesus Himself. We're we're being transformed in a way that is good for us. We're becoming better people, but perhaps more profoundly, it's good for everybody around us. Probably the main reason we need to change and be transformed is not so much just for our own benefit, but it's for the benefit of the people sat next to us, the people who, who in our families, the people in our workplaces, right? That's, that's what all this is about. So let me look at, we're going to read again from, a, a, um, from the message. And this is Paul talking about the, the way in which the Spirit transforms us. This is from Galatians chapter 5. And again, I think this version kind of captures something really beautiful. My counsel is this, live freely, okay, so the Spirit sets us free, animated and motivated by God's Spirit. Then you won't feed the compulsions of selfishness, for there is a root of sinful self-interest in us that is at odds with a free spirit, just as the free spirit is incompatible with selfishness. These two ways of life are antithetical, so you cannot live at times one way and at times another way according to how you feel on any given day. Why don't you choose to be led by the Spirit so, and so escape the erratic compulsions of a law-dominated existence? He's talking about those two different ways. It's obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Okay? So he's going to describe one way of living. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex. A stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. Frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness. Trinket gods magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfying wants, a brutal temper, an impotence to love or be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of community. He's describing me perfectly. (laughs) No, don't you feel like, uh, you can identify with this. I could go on, he says, but mercifully he stops. This isn't the first time I've warned you, you know. If you use your freedom this way, you will not inherit God's kingdom. In other words, we're free. We're free to live. But how are we going to live? But what happens when we live God's way? So what happens when we engage with the Spirit? He brings gifts into our lives, much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, and a conviction that basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. Legalism is helpless 
and bringing this about. In other words, trying harder and following rules is just not going to make that happen. It only gets in the way. Among those who belong to Christ, everything is connected with getting our own way and mindlessly responding to what everyone else calls necessities is killed off for good, crucified. Since this is the kind of life we have chosen, the life of the Spirit, let us make sure that we do not just hold it as an idea in our heads or a sentiment in our hearts, but work out its implication in every detail of our lives. That means we will not compare ourselves with each other as if one of us were better and another worse. We have far more interesting things to do with our lives. Each of us is an original. Okay, so we see there this the transforming power of the Spirit. As we engage with the Spirit, as opposed to just engaging with that other way, we, we connect with that ra- reality, and we're empowered to be different. You know, we, we become more loving, more kind, more full of joy, more patient, more gentle, and we have less of those, that, o- that other less. So the, the, what does the Spirit, or what does the work of the Spirit look like? What does the evidence of the Spirit look like? It, it's, it brings, the Spirit brings healing, brings transformation. The Spirit brings unity. We have a, maybe we could just, uh, we've got a couple of quick s- scriptures. This is the whole issue of oneness that we're talking about, which I think is very closely connected to healing and reconciliation and, and the transformation. All these things are very, in- very interconnected. Just as one body, though, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. We were all given one spirit to drink. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. Later on in, 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 in Galatians, he says this, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. So a, a manifestation of the Spirit is, uh, is seeing our oneness, seeing our, our, our togetherness, not, not the divisions, not the things that separate us or divide us. And, and, and then finally, the, the fourth thing for me, and again, I don't think this is an exhaustive list, but is the fourth thing is servanthood. Okay, so the Spirit empowers us to serve. Back to 1 Corinthians 12 again, um, where we were just a minute ago, the, the, Paul says this, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. In other words, the Spirit empowers us to live. The, 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 um, we, we all have giftings and talents and abilities. Well, we, it, when we're connected to the Spirit, when we're connected to this, the beautiful life that Jesus is talking about, they become for the common good. We become servants. That's not surprising because that's what Jesus did, right? That's the, the life that Jesus embodied, as we were talking about last week. That when, we, when we're connected to the other way, they become self-serving. Our, our abilities and our, our, our resources are all about us. And we might, you know, you can have a little bit of a here from time to time because that makes us feel better about ourselves. But when we're connected to the way of Jesus, when we're connected to the Spirit, our lives become an act of service. Okay, so these are the kind of things that, that Paul talks about. So um, there's a few things in the discussion questions this week ar- around those issues. And I encourage us to, to, to explore those. But I, I want to come to close out here to this final question. So we've talked about you know, what does the Spirit do? The Spirit sets us free. What does that look like? Well, it looks like healing. It, it looks like transformation. It looks like oneness. It looks like um, servanthood. How do we experience that? It's, it's still, I guess, that question's hanging out there. How do we experience this? And, um, you know, I, I think going back to some of the things that Paul's saying, particularly in that first passage I read from, from Romans, Paul's saying, look, there's, there's two ways of living, right? We we can live in the way of, let's call it, for, 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 in Paul's language, the way of sin and death, or we can live in the law of the spirit of life, the way of the spirit of life. There's two ways of living. One way is really easy, right? Um, our, our whole culture reinforces in us fear, self, selfishness, protectiveness, cynicism. It reinforces and encourages us to pull back from the vulnerability and openness of, tr- of the Trinitarian love that we've been talking about. It, 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 the, the culture around us says, don't trust that. The universe is not friendly, you know, if you want to put it in those sort of Einsteinian terms. Um, maybe God isn't good. Maybe actually if you live selflessly and vulnerably, you'll, you'll get screwed over. And actually that, you know, who wants that? 
It's not worth it. it won't, it's, not, it's not worth it in the long run. You're, you're going to lose out. And, and many of us grow up believing that, right? And we, so we hold on to things, and, we, and, we, and, and we, we end up nurturing that way of life in us. And whether we like it or not, we are being formed one way or the other. And I think Paul is making that point. We're being formed. If we're not being formed in the, in the way of the Spirit, then by default, we're, we're re- being formed in the other way. We're, we're being nurtured and, and reinforced, and we're getting into habits that we, t- we grow up with and we take into adulthood, and we know how to live that life. We're, we're experts at that life. We, we've honed and fine-tuned those skills, right? And we can identify with them, and, and, and we, we can identify with that way of life, and we can identify perhaps with the list of qualities that Paul um, had for the, the product of living in that, that way of life. That's me and the car on Palm Sunday, right? As a somewhat humorous but kind of tragic expression of what it's like when, we, when, when I live in that kind of way, when I'm not nurturing a different way of life. But it's possible to live this different way of life. What if we began to nurture connection to the Spirit? What if we practiced connecting to the Spirit and, 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 and explored what does that look like? What if we were, uh, what if that experience I had when I came out and found my car broken into, what if that became the norm because I was not just waiting for a conference or an experience of that kind of connection to the Holy Spirit, but if I, I nurtured it in my everyday life all the time, I constantly worked at it, and understanding that it's not about just trying harder, but intention and effort is certainly involved, but it's about opening myself up to the vulnerable love, opening myself up to this, this other way of living, allowing the spirit that's within me already to resonate and, and vibrate and, and just be, permeate my whole being more and, and, and live that out. And, and, there, and to me, there's, there's kind of two ways of doing that, right? We, and we call, we call them collectively, we, uh, to me, we call, it's what we call discipleship. It's this process of, process of trying to connect to the Spirit of God and, and, the, and the transforming power of God. And there's two ways of doing it. There are outside things, right? There are things we can do that connect with God outside of us. Remember, we were talking about God is out, out of us, around us. God is in us. We are in God, so therefore God is around us. But God is also in us, so God's on the inside. So we have this outside and inside place that we can find God. On the outside, it's think, we, we connect with God through things like um, nature. right? We, and, and, and It's different for all of us. We all find different ways of connecting with God easier than others. Let's go with what works for us. Some of us, it's connecting with God through nature. For some of it's through studying things, through studying the Bible, through reading, through, through, through that kind of stuff. For some of us, it may be through music. We, we engage with God. It might be through relationships, through serving others, through activism. You know, think about situations we've been in where we've been serving somebody and we kind of feel the presence of God and we feel a connection to God, right? So lots of different things we can do on the outside. But there are also ways that we can connect with God on the inside, right? If God is within us, then we can connect with God through um, silence and solitude. We do things to kind of quiet ourselves down so we can get in touch with God within us. Um, and that's why we practice, um, we have certain contemplative practices, right? We, there are, there's a whole tradition of, of doing that quietening work so we can connect with God. We, 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 practice, we do practice many of those here, and we have different scenario, different opportunities to practice those. You can go to our website, and we have a list of different practices. There's, an, you know, again, a, a, a almost infinite number of ways of doing this, but we're all different, so we need to find ways that work for us. Um, I, I, I guess the challenge for us, the challenge I'd want, want to leave us with, is what are we doing to engage with God's presence? I think we know some of the things that help us engage with God. The, thing, the problem is our, life gets, get, our lives get so full of other stuff that we, we, we lose contact with that, we lose touch with that, as I do. And then when push comes to shove and the moment happens, I spill over into anger and frustration and, and all that. And that's not because in that moment, oh, I didn't know how to pr- behave properly or I didn't, I didn't have the right prayer. It's because in the weeks building up to that, I haven't nurtured something within me that means I'm connected to God. I've, I've let things slip. 
And that's not something to, that we should feel guilty about or to, to be judged about. It's just like, what do we want? We want this life, right? We, we want to live the kind of life that Paul's talking about. So we need to engage with some of those external things that work for us and make them our habit, make them uh, the, the, uh, regular parts of our lives so that they nurture us in that direction. And we also need both that external and the internal silence and solitude where we hide ourselves away and put ourselves in the presence of God. Now, we're going to do that just briefly now as we, go, as we move into communion, right? We're going to take communion together. And during the communion time, we've got um, opportunities to connect with some uh, what, what I would call just sort of uh, spirit metaphors. Okay, so there are different metaphors used for the spirit in, um, in the uh, scriptures. One of them is wine, right? So actually there was a reference to that in the uh, Pentecost stories because they said these guys are drunk on wine. Um, well, we, we take grape juice usually with our, for our communion, but at these front two tables today, we have... Um, real wine. So if, if you want to steer clear of the real wine, don't come to these front tables. Uh, we've got juice on this table, grape juice, and the people serving at the sides will have grape juice as well. But wine is a symbol of the Spirit. You could think of wine as being kind of invigorating, uh, bringing joy, bringing, bringing us alive. I mean, it's in, in the best possible application of wine, okay? Um, and as you drink the wine, you know, it, it's kind of a different experience to drinking grape juice and kind of feel that as, as, as the, the Spirit. Um, we, on this side of the room, at this station over here, we have some oil. Oil is another illustration of the Spirit, right? And, or another metaphor for the Spirit. And so there's oil. You could rub some oil on your hands. Uh, you can maybe put it on your forehead or just, or just, just touch it. Oil um, kind of lubricates, e brings ease into our lives, right? Again, brings, brings life. It, it kind of loosens us up. Maybe, maybe there are areas in our lives that are just more like the other way of life we were talking about. And they're, just, they're just really tight and held back and not open. And we can, as we think about the oil, we can, we can invite the Spirit in to kind of loosen us up, to set us free. Um, on this side, we have water. There's a sort of dish at the front there and a jug of water. And water is another symbol for the Spirit of refreshment. It's cleansing. Um, you could drink it. I Probably people have put their hands in it, so I wouldn't recommend drinking this water. But um, you could come up and maybe put your hands in, you know, wash your hands, put some water on your face, uh, experience a refreshment of the Spirit. Um, we, fire is another um, illustration of the Spirit. And we have candles at the back, candles that uh, fire representing purification, transformation. Um, also hope and kind of just a heart cry to God. We light candles to say, God, help. Uh, and and it, they sort of symbolize prayer in some respects. And then the other, the other um, uh, metaphor for, for the Spirit is wind, right? And wind and breath in the Hebrew language are, are, the, are the same word. And so uh, what we're going to do now, just, just very briefly before we, um, before we take communion, is a simple breath prayer. You may have noticed in our, if you've been going through these discussion questions, each week, that every week there's also a practice, right? And that practice tries to get at some of these internal issues. It, it's a practice that tries to open us up to a connection to God in our everyday lives. And I want to make the case, and I'm, I'm putting it out there as a fellow struggler and a, and, and a fellow um, journeyer who um, takes one step forward, two back, and half forward, you know, you know like, like most of us. So I'm not in any way, putting this out there as an expert, but I want to make the case that if we just opened up a window of, of space for connection to God's Spirit each day, just a, just a small window, our, our lives would be very different. And what we're going to do is, is do a little breath, breath pair together. I'm going to get a chair, if I can disconnect it. Oh, yeah, I've nearly got, I nearly used bad language then. No, I, I'm only kidding. I'm in a really good place right now. Um, so um, what we're going to do maybe we could just put the li lights down um, Sarah um, we're just going to do a simple breath prayer this is about the easiest prayer on, on the planet um, and it's so easy that it kind of almost feels insignificant but let's think about this for a moment I'm, I'm, I'm going to sit here because I'm just going to sort of demonstrate it but I encourage you to, to close your eyes in, in a second okay? but I, I, here's, here's a way 
of physically getting into a, into a, a posture that could perhaps open us up to God's Spirit. And, and, and by posture, what I mean is this. We're going to center ourselves, and it's just a, from a, at a very practical level, it helps, I think, to be sat comfortably, to have your feet on the ground. You kind of feel, you feel the ground. We feel our presence here and now in this moment. And it also means that our legs aren't sort of, you know, dangling around because and we, and, we don't want our bodies to become a distraction. So, you know, sit with your legs like that and then just rest your hands on your lap or fold them like this. Just rest in a way that your body's not going to be a distraction for you, okay? And then we just, this is going to take a couple of minutes, that's all. But we're going to just close our eyes now. And this is something we've done many times before. But let's just become conscious of our breathing. And you may want to take some slightly deeper breaths in and out than you normally do, but don't hyperventilate. Just breathe in and out and enjoy breathing and be aware of your breathing. And, we, and turning our attention to our breath is really significant, I think, because firstly, there's actual physiological evidence that taking a few moments each day just to quiet ourselves like this and think about our breathing and do nothing else has a relaxation effect in our bodies. It has a really positive effect on our bodies. So if that's all we did, there's a positive outcome. But I think there's a couple of other reasons why breathing is really, uh, focusing on our breathing is really important. First one is this, that we have to breathe. Breathing is something beyond our control in a way. And so there's something submissive about it. We, we, when we think about our breathing, we're, we're acknowledging that we're not in control. We have to breathe. And things in life are beyond our control. And it helps us submit. It helps us surrender. It helps us give up with all this effort and all this trying that is so tiring. And then another reason breathing, focusing on our, focusing on our breathing is fantastic is because I think it's this perfect illustration of the fact that God is, we are in God, God is around us, and God is in us. The air is all around us. We are in the air. But the air is also in us because we breathe it in. And we can get lost in this air just like we can get lost in God. We can see ourselves as one with God if we turn our attention to our breathing like this. And so just for a few moments, we're going to actually do that picture. This room... our surroundings as full of God. This is God's presence. We are in God's presence. We are in God. And we are breathing God in. And we are breathing out into God. And we are breathing God in. And we're breathing out into God. And God is love. This presence is complete, perfect, defining love. No judgment, no critique, no evaluation, just love and acceptance. So let's just breathe that in. Let's breathe in the Spirit of God. And as we breathe out, Let's just relax into God and into that acceptance. now as you breathe in, maybe there's an area of your life that seems quite obvious that where you're fearful or hurt or afraid, stressed out, frustrated, disappointed, whatever it is, there may be a part of your life where 
you really want, to, want God to come to. But maybe also you're a little afraid of God coming there because it just feels so tender, so vulnerable. Whatever that is, let's be breathe in. Let's breathe God into that space in our life, into that place. And as we breathe out, let's just relax as we let that part of us just be in God and relax into God. So come, Holy Spirit. Come to us. Empower us. Help us see our oneness with you, that we are in you and you are in us. Help us live this life. Help us live this beauty, this mystery, this amazing thing. The life of Christ.